you know, bring this technology to people's homes. And Skyrunner is one of the, I think they've been in contact with the committee club as well. So definitely wanted them invited. So if that's our committee of people, we're going to give each of them a chance to share if they want to about some of the information that a lot of this happened in the last six months. Uh, either the broadband committee has been formed at the county level, or there have been surveys or mapping, or various things that have developments that have gone forward. So uh, if Glenn Knox is not here yet, who was our um, sort of the state representative, I was going to start at his level. But um, if he comes in, we'll just uh, blend him in. But in the meantime, I'll have Sarah Thompson share about uh, Southwestern Commission Region A and some of the stuff that's been happening in the last six months. Sure, you bet. Um, and you're welcome you to just sit. Sure, OK. Um, <coughs> Good afternoon, I'm Sarah Thompson, the Executive Director of the Southwestern Commission. We are the Council of Governments for the seven far western counties, so we work with the local governments, counties and towns in the region on a variety of issues. Um, we've been around 50 years and, and we've always worked on infrastructure issues in the past and currently a lot of those had to do with um, water and sewer, wastewater, things like that. Um, broadband is the infrastructure issue of this era, so we are getting thrust into that arena as well. Um, we continuous, continuously hear about the need for better broadband in the region. Um, it's the number one um, public perception of economic development challenges in the region. So. Back in February, we convened a group of stakeholders. Um, some of the folks up here spoke to the group. Um, after that, that day, we came out of it deciding um, for a regional strategy for each county um, to form a broadband committee. Some already had the Macon County already had for a couple of years an active broadband committee. Others are, are now forming them um, with the, the goal and the intention to work as a region to do a broadband assessment and plan. Um, so that's what we're moving forward with. We work as the lead regional agency for the Appalachian Regional Commission, which is a federal agency that provides funding often for things like planning and infrastructure deployment in Appalachia. So they're funding the planning process for us with some local funds going into it. Um, I'm going to read my notes a little bit to talk about the details because I'm very quickly trying to become a broadband expert myself. Um, uh, this is not easy stuff and this is why we will be hiring a consultant who is a, an expert to take the region through this process. Um, the first phase is um, we'll be starting this fall. We have an RFP out for to hire a consultant to do phase one now. Um, it is to develop a plan to advance broadband infrastructure and investment in the region. Phase one will involve a lot of training to the local broadband committees and local officials um, on pertinent issues and to conduct community assessment and profiles. Some of the training that's involved will be to identify broadband friendly policies that will lower the cost and streamline um, implementation for the providers that the local communities can do themselves. Um, some of those in, include examples of them as, um, for example, a day once policy, if you're going to be putting in um, a sewer down your main road, you can go ahead and lay the conduit for fiber while you've got the road dug up, so when the provider comes in, they don't need to cover that expense. They would just pull their fiber through the um, conduit that the local community installed. Those, those are examples of policies that local communities can enact to, um, to try to get ahead of things um, in the anticipation of a provider coming in. Um, it'll also, phase one will um, consist of a survey of existing assets and resources that would be of value to private providers um, and surveys um, regarding the level of service in your community. I know Macon County has done a ton of surveying already, so I just want to reiterate that this regional planning process will work in each county where they are. We're not going to make you redo anything you've already done. 
Um, but we're going to take all seven counties through the same process together, um, really for the sake of um, getting the most out of our limited resources we have out here. Um, so we'll survey residents, businesses, and organizations to determine level of need of service. And um, each committee will work with a, a committee or a community profiling tool, which is essentially a process that the local communities will go through to identify what their assets are, where their greatest needs are, um, policies they can put in place, et cetera, et cetera, on a local level. We'll all be going through together as a region. Um, that's phase one. Phase two then takes all the information that we've gathered, all the assets in the re region, all of the greatest need areas, all of the areas for opportunity, and the consultant actually gets an, um, a request for providers out to come in and look at the information we've gathered and start talking about public-private partnerships for broadband deployment. Um, so that is, in a, a nutshell, what we're doing. Like I said, it's a little confusing for those of us that just want to get on our computer at home and have reliable service. Um, we're modeling the regional process after um, a process that's been used in the Research Park Triangle area and also in the Greater Asheville area um, from the consultants that I've spoken with. It's, it's really the groundwork that we need to do as a region to, before we go out and ask providers to come provide service. There's a lot of work we can do first to in incentivize them to come. Thank you, Sarah. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll have some chance for questions at the end. So uh, if you could just kind of hold till we work through some of the folks. Um, I thought I'd move to the county level next. Um, we can just start with uh, Mr. Shields at the end uh, for Maine County Broadband Committee. Sarah, I want to see you. My name is Gary Shields, uh, County Commissioner, along my colleague here, uh, Carl Blisby, uh, who's kind of a person in this field that we have to bounce a lot of stuff off, also he's a, a colleague. Um, we, over the last year, we, we've made some progress. We've been the best kept secret in town, and, and that's what we try to be. Uh, Tony Beacon was with us last in, in May in our meeting there, very informative person. Uh, Sarah's been with us, uh, Tim Wheel's been with us, so we've been lucky be able to punch into some people who are very knowledgeable. Now, when this first started off, uh, I was on the planning board um, via getting elected to uh, the county commissioner role. Then after, uh, it, 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 what happened was the county wanted the planning board to take over this broadband initiative. Well, Jack Morgan, uh, who's the person with the county, not talking with you today, I'm not sure I can say this. We got down the road and we felt like, you know, this is too big for the planning board. We need to take this back to the county commissioners, which I was one of them. Carl came a few months later and say, look, we don't have the time to do this. The planning board does it. So if you go walk in on the planning board and have them to do this, you make sure be, be sure they've got the time and expertise to, to do this. So what we did, the county took it back over. Now Derek Rowland, who's our county manager, he uh, and uh, Tommy Dickens here is our EDC person, both are on the team. Derek has been the, kind of the front runner on this, uh, putting it together. But anyway, we went and uh, the, the first thing we did, what we wanted to do, I was so dumb about this stuff. Uh, it's hard to grasp what was going on. So, through some of these fellows here, we invited them each month to come to our commissioners meeting, say something broadbandish. <laughs> <laughs> we can find out what's going on here. Get something in this head. And so, 
They would uh, come to the meeting, the provider, Tim came. And so each month, our objective was, my objective was, is to educate the county commissioners uh, on the language. It's a whole different language. Now the call is not a different language. The Tim is not a different language. It's Greek to me, what you were talking about. And so through a process of time, the county commissioners understood what we were trying to do. And so we got to a, a place there where Derek and I said, now, we got to come here. we got to find us a team to put together and move this thing to a room where we start condensing this thing down into something real. Kind of like making bread, you know. Actually, Father, you, you just got to get to make bread. And so we've been able to, to find a, a group of people within the county, uh, whether it be uh, economic development or uh, emergency management, those type of people. And we sat down and we said, now, we've got to continue this education part because you had uh, our uh, IT person at the county level. He can talk this broad manage. And uh, so we, we started bringing people in from the community, from Sarah, to a lot of people to come and talk to us. Even the smallest stuff. I, I'm, I'm learning a few languages. I know what I'm making. I know what up and down. <laughs> and so uh, one day I was coming back from Raleigh, Charlotte, stopped at a carpet place. We chatted a few minutes, and, and he knew that that fellow never be back. He didn't know how to do the language. Uh, I knew what <laughs> Antana was. He took it outside and showed me an Antana. But anyway, uh, we've come to the point now to collect that information and a certain degree of knowledge. We think, Tony, I believe in our last meeting, we think we're make, ready to move Sarah to phase one. Tony, is that about, did you pick that up? You've been to one meeting? We've been, we're, we're, we're about, we're ready to move into that. So, the reason I want to say something today is because I want to meet with some people who can guide us into phase one. And, and I know there's a cost to that. I have no idea what is too high, too low, middle, or what. <clears throat> but we need to be guided into that. So we're ready for it. And um, so we'll be, Tommy or somebody be in touch with you, try to get a handle on uh, what we are, either with, what kind of cost or anything. Okay. Uh, we can tell us good to see you. How you like one? Doing fine, sir. Sorry, I'm late. Sorry, I'm late, principal. <laughs> <laughs> Let me say one thing about Tim Wells. A lot of you probably know Tim. Um, Tim has been a, a brain blower of mine for about six months. He calls me up and he says, uh, I need to talk to you. I said, Well, we we'll want we'll go to the East Franklin McDonald's and find us a table, sit down there. And that's why I'm so confused. I can't even drink my cocoa. <laughs> uh, uh, he wants somebody to kind of blow your mind. You sit down with him. He's been this stuff. I want to say it's all of my life. I mean, we're close to the same age. Yeah. But anyway, he's a very knowledgeable person, and I just want to say thank you, sir. Appreciate you, and I hope your wife's doing fine. Did you want to go to the next comment? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'll just follow up on a couple of things. Because uh, <coughs> Ronnie's also on making the county right end. Uh, as Mr. Shell said, we've been probably really going at this series from about the first year. Uh, and and some, uh, some outcome we've had, outcomes we've had so far, that of course we did a survey, broadband survey through the school system, through the students of the big home, and then they and their parents filled out uh, uh, a pretty significant uh, broadband survey to where we could find out where pockets of coverage were and where pockets of coverage aren't. We felt like this was the most cost efficient way to do it rather than sending out 36,000 uh, questionnaires by the mail. Uh, you did go around 5,000, something like that, uh, 4,000, 4, 4, uh, surveys. Had a real good response rate. We got about 58% of those back, which is, if you've done surveys, that's significant. So we realize that people are very interested. And of course, in the coming weeks, hopefully we will be sharing those with the community as we, we continue our work. 
our beginning work has been basically asset management. What we have, what we don't have. And uh, I'll tell you what, some of these providers are very secretive about what they have. Of course, that's business. But uh, our hope is that we, we can find that middle ground where we can help move along, whether it be infrastructure construction, uh, incentivizing, uh, working with private providers to partner into spreading uh, to uh, spreading broadband throughout the community. And there's some very innovative people in the community already in Camp Wells, working with a group at the Carter today. Uh, Tony Deacons uh, down in Octo with his group. Cowley School is what it's a Spencer board also looking at options. Uh, so uh, in, in the overall picture is the tightest together in some sort of coherent strategy. And uh, that's what we're doing. Thank you. And uh, let's move to Swain County which as a younger committee, it only hasn't been around quite as long as making a county project committee, but you want to speak to uh, the one thing time. about our broadband committee, we haven't been together two years. It's uh, <laughs> 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 only been about six months or ten. I don't know if it's like December or December. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some, some it seems like two years. Seems like <laughs> Uh, well, the, the Swain County Committee has been around for just a, a few months. Um, there are nine, nine members um, on the committee uh, that are all uh, appointed through uh, the Swain County Commissioners. Um, our first meeting was uh, March 3rd. Well, it's nice to hear that we're actually on the right track. Uh, we're, we're discussing the things that you, you all have accomplished um, with, with the mapping. Um, and uh, the survey, um, but again, we've only met a few times. The first, the first meeting was really just an introductory type of a meeting, and the second meeting was, you know, there's this uh, phrase of forming, storming, norm. The, the second meeting was a lot of storming. Actually, we were just trying to um, figure out what we we're here to do, and it wasn't until we actually uh, um, nominated. And, got herself a chair. So uh, the superintendent of school, Sam Patillo, is now our chair. And he took over the third meeting. Suddenly, we were on track a little bit. So and it also coincided with uh, hearing information about what was happening um, with Southwestern Commission. So we'd all read the email that, that went out sometime in, in I guess, April at the time. And, and we were ready to discuss that. And talk about needs assessments. We were already talking about needs assessments. One of the one of our members is on is, is actually uh, in the field tech for Frontier. Just off the top of his head, he knows exactly where, where Frontier is in Swain County and probably a lot about Jackson and Macon as well. Uh, so we already have a Frontier map, uh, you know, and we're planning to fill in that map with other providers as we can. Um, uh, I wrote down some things, but actually Sarah covered it. You know, we're basically just taking um, the format that was, was presented to us through phase one, uh, the work, the scope of work through phase one, and we're kind of looking forward to working through the process. Um, one thing, our next meeting is coming up in June, and we have uh, Kevin Conover, or I'm sorry, Keith Conover from the state of yeah, he'll be coming to our meeting, and uh, I guess this will be just the first of many, as, as you stated, uh, consult or, you know, experts in the field uh, speaking to us. So, uh, looking forward to that. What what date was your meeting? June twentieth. Okay. So if he's coming here from the state. Folks could line up with him, and he could visit more than just. I would. Jim, it's more time to come to you. We're a yeah, 6 p.m. Yeah. 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 We're at 6 p.m. meeting. 6 p.m. meeting mm -hmm. in Swain County. The, the North Carolina Broadband Infrastructure Office, well, I understand it got a lot of its momentum going <laughs> under the former governor last year, but they've been backed up by the current governor. <coughs> and Keith Carver was going to be here today, but he had a big schedule conflict. He was going to send Glenn Knox 
but I think they, something got lost there. But um, yeah, he's he's very interested. He said now he is the Western Region representative. I think there's about 27 counties under his purview, um, about a third of the state. Um, there's three reps for each region, so he is ours with the North Carolina with, with the efforts going forward under the governor and, and the legislature. Uh, I thought we'd go to Jackson County. Uh, Rich Price is, uh, I guess, you're the, the voice to some extent until the broadband committee is formed, if ever. But I know you've got your finger on a lot of the pulse of what's going on in Jackson County in regard to broadband. So if you want to, whatever you care to share. Sure. Well, I, I, I think it's safe to say that we're all working towards the, the same end conclusion. Uh, the work may just go in somewhat different fashion. Um, we have not appointed that committee, uh, and in Jackson County we'll reference it as a task force. Uh, that actually will be done within the next, uh, names were just submitted into our county manager today, as a matter of fact. Those names were approved by our business and industry advisory committee, which is my advisory board in Jackson County. Um, when I stepped into this role some three and a half years ago, uh, shortly thereafter, I was sort of thrust into broadband and trying to understand, uh, you know, our shortcomings in Jackson County and what the needs were. And a couple things had happened uh, prior to my arrival, several things I should say. Uh, one, Travis Lewis, uh, who's a, a very successful businessman in entrepreneur in Jackson County, had begun his internet startup called SkyFi. Uh, and Travis was in negotiation with our airport authority. Uh, in order to construct a new uh, communication tower on Airport Authority property that he would use for the transmission of, uh, of his internet signal. Uh, at the same time, uh, I was introduced to Keith Conover. And Keith Conover and our former county manager in Jackson County, Mr. Chuck Wooten, and others had already been in discussions with many of the internet service providers uh, that would serve Jackson County to understand um, you know, where our served and underserved communities were, um, if we were served or we really served by high-speed internet. Um, and so a lot of work had already been done to the point that there were GIS map layers that were, that were put together that I can pull up today and show the areas in the county which are served by high-speed, those that are served by DSL, and those areas that are truly unserved. And so that began discussions a little bit prior, I would say, to our, to our regional conversation with regard to, well, we need to understand what we have to work with. And so building relationships with people like Matt Sanger in Boston West, uh, and, and we had subsequent meetings with folks from Morse Broadband and Frontier and, and other service providers to, to understand what their limitations were in terms of, well, why can't you just come into Jackson County and do this for us? And uh, we talk about this all the time, and, and every county in the West has the same issue, but when you stand in the center of Jackson County, if it's in Silver or Callaway, wherever, and you just sort of look around, it becomes very, very apparent as to why we're, we're probably going to struggle to get in-ground fiber optic broadband to every resident, all 40,000 plus residents in Jackson County. So we started doing some of this work on our own. Tom mentioned asset maps, understanding, you know, where. We have fiber in the ground. We have fiber above ground. Uh, we have uh, um, existing tower sites all over the county. And, 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 and we began to really shift and try to not necessarily focus on one particular magic bullet that was going to solve our problem. Uh, we're in an agreement in the county that wireless and certainly SkyFi are going to play a significant role in being able to get high-speed internet into as many homes and businesses as we possibly can. Uh, but we have a unique opportunity, and I'll mention that briefly. For example, we have a university there that sits in the center of our county that has its own distribution, electric, electric distribution system. Uh, in fact, they used to make their own electricity years ago. Uh, they don't do that any longer. They buy from new energy, but they still have ownership of the electric system. And they serve some 4,000 plus customers outside of the university footprint in what we would call the central portion of Jackson County. And there was discussion at one time about the university potentially selling that system to do because why does the university need to be in the elect electricity distribution system, you know, sorry. But we sat down and started talking about it. And again, Keith Conover came in and, and a lot of people that are much more intelligent than I am. And we started talking about, well, how could we use this system that serves these 4,000 customers 
who are probably in an underserved condition, how can we use that to leverage and, and get better service into those areas? And, and maybe do it in a combination of above ground fiber plus wireless application, et cetera. And so we've attempted to do some of the legwork that, that you've heard about and will hear about before we put our committee together. And, and our committee is going to consist of individuals and organizations that have been identified as having some type of resource. In other words, it's, it's, we've purposely kept this away, and I don't mean any respect to, to any of our elected officials, et cetera, but the, the hope is, is we don't want to make this just another political appointed committee. We want to make it a committee that's really got the knowledge to, to, to turn it into practical application. And, and then with our commissioner's blessings, um, they've agreed that we've identified those, those stakeholders or those folks who have resources, the people who have ownership of infrastructure or electrical distribution systems or those who may have uh, leverage within state government. You put those folks in the room, we hand them the information that has been compiled about here are the assets, here's, here's the surveys that have been completed so we know where and where we don't have service. Now let's get together and really strategically figure out what are we going to do about it. And so that's sort of been our approach thus far in Jackson County. Our committee hopefully will be uh, approved and up and running within the next 30 to 60 days. Um, and I'll, I'll add one more plug in for the, the regional concept. Um, uh, sort of uh, in conjunction with Region A, the economic developers from the seven western counties uh, have formed uh, a new marketing arm for economic development called the Mountain West Partnership. Uh, that organization is, is certainly in agreement that a regional approach to the proliferation of true high-speed broadband is, is, is certainly warranted because it provides us a greater opportunity to go out and seek funding and funding of significant measures. The needs in each county are going to be very, very different. We certainly understand that. Uh, but in order to really go after significant dollars of which it's going to take for all of us to really make a dent in this issue, uh, at least from the economic development perspective, I believe we can say that this regional approach, in addition to our own strategies with each individual county, uh, it is, is what we believe is our best foot forward. Well, thank you. Um, <clears throat> next, I'd like to invite uh, John Mackey to speak for the Holly Springs Community Club. They've also been doing some surveys on broadband availability. And uh, I haven't seen the results from yet. We don't distribute them as this building. And I know you did some other uh, sites, but if you'd like to share anything about that survey. Um, no, we were actually the second community to do a survey, and I apologize for how I sound, but I have bronchial asthma. And as you know, it's crazy right now. Uh, Cartoon J started the first uh, survey, and we went to a regional meeting last August, and from that meeting, we jumped onto the back bandwagon because the Department of Agriculture was working with us. Evidently, in other states, there is a program going on where farmers were the first enrolled with broadband because of all the applications that could be used in profit. I don't know the results of their survey. But we turned uh, 93 surveys over to them, and then Tim came over and spent some time with us. And we actually drove around and, and plugged in latitude longitude to find out what coverage was all, already here in Macon County. Since then, we spent about seven days doing that, just seeing where the signal's going. Because in our community, there's a lot of uh, concern with Onion Mountain, whether they can get service or not. Well, based on the tower that's in Otto community, excuse me, 100% uh, coverage, no problems. But we got 135 surveys back on the second phase that we did. Did some knocking on doors, tried to get some letters in the paper, that didn't work, so got on the phone and just started calling people. And people are much more knowledgeable then I realized that when I started in this, I've been frustrated since 1991. 
I have been a state contractor with the state testing division since January 1991. I had to drop off in 2005 because Frontier cut off my DSL in Holly Springs. And since 2005, I have not been able to get any type of high speed at all. So I basically lost a fourth of my income from that. We have had people, I'm very active in the community club, we have had people who have moved into Holly Springs over the past four years, stay there six months to two years, and then leave because they could not have their businesses here and not have good internet coverage. So there's a lot of this going on, but one of the things that I realized quickly after talking to Frontier, uh, when I heard their speech, I realized I needed to know more. But when I called the state, they told me that McDowell County and Watauga were the two counties in the state that were already pretty close to 100% coverage. So I took a little trip and went over. Uh, McDowell Library, 2.30 in the morning, 30 cars in the parking lot. <laughs> Kids doing assignments because that's the only way they have any hookup come out here after hours now that there is a, a powerful wi-fi the, the parking lot up to five o'clock in the morning i know <laughs> i come out here early sometimes <laughs> the one that interested me the most because macon county the average age is aging quickly uh, according to the state the average age in macon county is now 63. Uh, in Watauga, if you are critically homebound and need nursing care or you need somebody to check your body scent on a regular basis, they now have a program in place where they can put a com computer monitor in the home. They can do blood pressure, they can do sugar, they can do heart monitoring, they can do any type of diabetes monitoring just by dialing the phone and pushing a button. And I looked at that and said, no, Macon County really needs that. But the second one I ran into is my own. I am now 80% deaf. So if you see me doing this a lot, I read this. Uh, I've been trying to get a cap phone for the past two years. I can't get a cap phone without a certain amount of internet coverage. So I wonder how many people in Macon County are in that situation, that they are basically cut off from communications because they can't get a cat tail phone. So there are some areas that we all need to be aware of. 135 surveys in this second phase, frustration, some ugly comments of <coughs> observers, uh, sur surveyors. But I will tell you today at 11.30, and I will tell you who my service provider is. My download speed was zero. My upload speed was one megabyte. That's typical. I can go on the internet and I'll be cut off five times in the next three minutes. I cannot do anything except read, in, uh, read emails and send emails. I'm not alone. But we need a whole lot more people here talking about this. One thing I did do that I have not talked to Mr. Shields about, uh, when I started in this process, I was on the state employees credit union board. So I approached the board in Raleigh to have it open so that internet would be considered as a necessary service so that they would accept possible grants from the counties. I have been told, I do not have it in writing yet, that we can now do that. So that gives us another place to get some money. Yeah, Otto is the probably the largest community in Lincoln County in terms of population. The, we started looking at this 
late last year, kicked off a committee in January of this year, and um, we've got uh, we got some some people. We did some samples, uh, some surveys, mostly anecdotal surveys, not paper surveys, but we leveraged the school survey. We're also working with the state in terms of a new survey that uh, Wes, Wesley just put out that's uh, finally going to put some facts around the map that they've been handing around that says that Macon County has 58 to 80 percent of its people access of high-speed broadband. But that's not a county map. No. <laughs> well, that's a state map. Um, so in any case, uh, we've had some fun with that one. But what got us to doing this, and I just want to keep my notes in front of me so I don't go too far astray here, um, is, is we realized that as a community, we had to have the internet if we were going to not just thrive, but to survive. And it wasn't to watch Netflix or do games or anything like that. It was really came down to a matter of business development on one part and public health and safety on the other part. And those are two critical things. So we broke the project into four uh, phases. Ours was to find the current state, which is what do we have for assets, resources, who are our friends and who are not our friends, and so forth and so on. And then we wanted a future state to find what it was we really wanted to ask for here. You know, it's nice to write in a letter to Santa Claus, but you better be somewhat specific uh, about what kind of toys are you be walking around dressed funny. Um, what we what we set as our goals is that 85% of our community to have access to a minimum of the current definition of broadband, which is the 25 up, I mean 25 down and three up. Um, there's 15% that we know effectively we're not going to get a lot of these people up are off the grid, want to stay off the grid, you know, but you know nonetheless. Um, we also want to whatever we get to be extensible and to be expandable. Extensible meaning that as a population, uh, or excuse me, as the technology moves forward, we can keep up with that technology. I mean, we're talking about, you know, the current definition of broadband being a big deal and other communities are moving to gigabit service and that's, uh, you know, maybe someday we'll get there. And of course, to be expandable is we expect the population of the community to grow. And We've had our own kinds of issues uh, in terms of businesses that can't, you know, can't do their business in the area because of the lack of adequate internet, myself included. And the fact that is the population moves more and more to people working at home, uh, remote work, and so forth and so on. Well, those people aren't going to stop here. <laughs> They're certainly not going to buy homes here. Put their kids in schools here. Um, what we found in the current state is, is that we're mostly frontier with some more uh, broadband uh, in, in the auto area. Uh, roughly 40% of our population does not have internet access of, of any kind. And the vast majority of, of the rest of them have something on the order of two or three megabits down and some fractional uh, data rate up. Um, we've been told by uh, Frontier that you know service is probably about as good as it's going to get for a long time, uh, and that you know fiber is, is when we talk about fiber, it's very expensive to put fiber in the ground because we're mountainous and so forth and so on. And I'll, I'll give you a kicker here in a minute on that one. Um, we've talked to EMCs, so we you know talk about aerial fiber. Uh, we talked to Haywood. We've talked to Blue Ridge. We're trying to talk to Haversham, uh, who's pulling gigabit service up into Dillard, Georgia, <coughs> just south of us. Um, so we're, you know, we're looking at, uh, at prospective uh, providers. We've talked about uh, uh, wireless in, in a lot of cases, and there's a role for wireless. We believe that ultimately the technology solution is going to be comprised of fiber plus wireless uh, to a large degree. But what really uh, shocked us was when we found out, talking about hiding in plain sight, we have fiber in the right-of-ways of just about all of the state-designated roads in Ottawa. Been there since the 90s, most of it. Some of it got put in the early 2000s. 
most of it's 183 strand fiber, which is to say it's, it's pretty good. Uh, Frontier doesn't want to talk about it, and they own it. They inherited it when they got everything from Verizon and all that was rolled over. Um, so we already have a fiber. So the excuse of fiber is too expensive to put in the ground, so it got washed away. With that, the combination of everybody in Raven County has got it as well, and they got the same kind of terrain that we do. Um, so we, we believe that there's some feasibility. The other thing that we found out was is that there is a lot of money out there to work with, to do this. But it can't go from the people who have the money directly to the providers themselves. So a provider can't go and apply for the grants to, to do auto. Some intermediate agency has got to do that. And so one of our actions coming out of our future plans, the fourth phase, is to identify and work with potential intermediaries, people who can bridge between the funders and the providers and, and get something going in hopefully less than geologic time. I'm 70. I'd like to see this happen where I can still use it and read the screen. <laughs> but I run my speedtest.com. But uh, yeah, it, there's, there's a number of providers. They're not all the traditional kinds of providers. EMCs are, you know, uh, Blue Ridge serves 4,000 people in Murphy, North Carolina. Blue Ridge is out of Georgia. Um, Haywood, like I said, is very conversational about it, but they've got some constraints put on them by the peculiar legislation in, in North Carolina. We have been working with the state, uh, with Keith and, and Leslie both for quite some time. Keith's sort of been a uh, over-the-shoulder consultant for us as we've been going through all of this. So where we are right now is we've completed three out of four of our phases and we're down to the point now of saying where is that entity that is going to bridge funding to provider and how are we going to solicit the best providers vis-a-vis -vis RFP, whatever other mechanism is in place and, and to form the management, provide the oversight to ensure that we in auto can get the kind of internet service that we require. It's not, a, it's not an ask anymore, it's an insist. The, uh, we'd like to see it done. We don't want to be a unique one-off. Uh, I think that would be impossible for ultimately the county or the region or, or anybody to manage. It certainly will work with anybody. Um, we're really easy to get along with, but uh, it's, it's something that we do want to drive and we are going to be very persistent and very vocal and very active about it. Thank you very much. Um, like I said, I, th I think this is a hopeful time. Um, things are happening. There's forces in place represented by these folks here that want to see broadband happen. And you know, that's uh, something I think the, the audience, uh, the public responses I've gotten to this meeting, um, and I think everybody in the room would like to see happen. I love your goals of 85% you know, of Maine County being able to get Broadband, not just internet, not just what is sometimes called high speed, but real true current definition broadband. Um, now, uh, the next thing we'd like to, I'd like to talk to is uh, Mr. Tim Will uh, with Catawba Partners, who was recommended by, was it, I think, the Making Broadband Committee, but I know you've had contact with some other people on the group, they referenced you, and I believe you've got some experience with bringing broadband to some. North Carolina communities that didn't have very good, and now they're looking at pretty good percentages. So if you want to talk to them all about maybe you have some of that one. I'd love to. Thank you. And thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Um, in 1972, I learned wireless broadband communications in the U.S. Army. I've been in it. I stayed in it until um, about year 2003 when I retired. And I became a public high school teacher, and I moved up here to become a, to extend that career. And when I got into the county I live in now, Rutherford County, uh, as I was applying for jobs, I realized none of the high schools had had uh, broadband. Um, they were using DSL circuits for the entire school. And uh, anyway, so um, uh, you can either do something about something you think is wrong and unjust because any teacher will tell you 
principal will shield and tell you. You can tell the kids that don't have a lot of fans yes. in school in their classroom. You can tell them. And uh, so uh, I went out and raised, uh, I tried to uh, get the uh, providers to help, uh, even though uh, we had fiber throughout the county. Um, they, they called it dark fiber, they said we couldn't use it, for whatever their reasons were, the providers. And uh, so we went out and raised a million and a half dollars from the Golden Leaf Foundation and ran uh, fiber to every school and every EMT uh, under the idea that we would then broadcast Wi-Fi in the schools and from uh, the EMT. And uh, then no customers. I made the classic mistake, if you build it, they will come. <laughs> uh, because uh, so for whatever reason. So we ended up showing people, educating people, the benefits of broadband. If you don't have it, you don't know what you miss it. It's like getting religion. So um, anyway, we, uh, we, uh, the way we put the hook in is we showed uh, the farmers and the ex-farmers how to sell their products directly to high-end chefs in Charlotte, North Carolina, 70 miles away. They had no prior contact with them. Uh, I had to teach people to read, to be able to teach them to use the internet, because it's text-based. But we trained 140 farmers on computers, how to use them. And we started up a business that then shipped uh, low, uh, truckloads of produce down to Charlotte. And, uh, and by the time we were done, um, the farmers were being paid for the crop before it was picked. Because the chefs learned that the farmers would put their inventory for the week up on uh, Sunday night, and if they didn't order on Sunday night, it was all gone. So, um, but we weren't getting the usage that we wanted. So we went and we, um, the president of my board of directors was a uh, was the head of the water authority, and we put radios from a provider, a wireless provider, that said that he would work with us on water towers. And uh, I can remember arguing with a federal agency for which I got the original radios, the money, over the idea that you could do that. And. Uh, uh, obviously you can because now they're promoting that very same concept. <laughs> so um, through one thing or another, I met some of the good folks here in Macon County. And uh, the way I look at the world now after having done that and worked with it, is that I don't look from the provider's infrastructure out how I can expand that infrastructure for the providers. I identify the communities that need it and then figure out a way wirelessly to connect back to the infrastructure. And that's tried and true, and it's the way I learned it. And if you don't think that it works or it's not secure enough, I'll, I'm going to scare you right now, because I learned it in 1972 working in the Pershing Missile Nuclear Missile System. And that's exactly what we did. They tell us where in the Black Forest and the Australian Mountains we had to go but they didn't tell us how to connect back. So I ended up putting a lot of radios and pine trees. <laughs> but, so I'm um, here to help. I found two other people, or actually they recruited me after I left Foothills Connect. Um, and uh, we're here to do rural economic development. And just to put it in perspective, when I started, and I can't take credit for any of this, when I started, Rutherford County was 99th out of 100 counties in economic development, had the highest rate of unemployment. And I'm here to tell you that in April or March, when they reevaluated, we were tier two, no worse than 67th. And that's just in six years. That's what broadband will do to your country. One, you have more kids right now taking classes online than you have in what the teachers call meat in the seat. All right, right now. Uh, one out of six people is getting married over the internet, uh, or meeting their match over the internet. <laughs> and uh, the number of small businesses, and I include farms. In fact, we 
change the terminology. We don't call them farms. We call them small businesses called farms. All right? That there's a booming small business economy, not only in Rutherford, but it's spread to Polk. And some of it is spread to, to uh, McDowell County, but not much. And that's all I got to say, except thanks for having me here. I'm here to, uh, to help the park. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, invited Mr. Don Davis, who couldn't come, but Mr. Amber and uh, Mr. J.J. Boyd from Skyrunner Internet. Uh, we've heard some success stories about some of the stuff they've been able to do with, I believe, point to point wireless. Uh, if you'd like to, anything you want to say about your company's plans or great capabilities or success stories for a rural community? So uh, I'm Art Mandler, and along with J.J. Boyd and Don Davis, who's not here, we're the owners of Skyrunner Internet. Uh, we are a primarily wireless, terrestrial wireless internet service provider. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about what that is specifically, so I want to make sure that everybody understands it. Uh, we've been in business since 1999. Uh, we're centered in Asheville. We have a presence in about nine counties in western North Carolina. Uh, and um, we um, have been focusing recently on uh, not just wireless internet, but on the combination of fiber optic cable and wireless internet, which we believe is in fact the direction of the future uh, for a lot of rural uh, North America. Uh, and certainly, Baden County is a great target for that. Um, we, uh, we, have, uh, we are the people that put the radios on the water towers that Tim Will was talking about. Good to see you. Uh, good to see you, Tim. And, uh, we, uh, we have a, a pretty large presence in Rutherford County, Polk County as well, uh, where we are uh, providing uh, high quality internet to <laughs> communities that are certainly considered rural uh, by any standard. Um, uh, talk a little bit about the technology. Terrestrial radio is point-to-point -point radios. Uh, they are um, usually in a variety of unlicensed frequencies. So that means that, that the channels that they're broadcasting on are not specifically controlled channel for channel by the FCC, by the Federal Communications Commission. Rather, they're open for use by uh, businesses like us <coughs> or the public. Um, these radios uh, that we use to provide internet service have uh, in, improved in quality dramatically over the last 10, 15 years. Uh, when uh, Don started putting radios up in 1999, the best they could do at that time was about 1.5 megabits per second, which at that time was fast internet. Um, but now we have radios uh, that will do 10 gigabits of throughput. And we have radios right now in play that are doing 1.5 gigabits per second. That's a, you know, 1,500 megabits per second. And the cost of that pair of radios is uh, but about three thousand dollars. So that's an incredibly inexpensive way to get fiber type speeds from one point to another. Um, the other thing about these, uh, about these radios is that they've proven now over over several decades to be quite durable, quite reliable. Um, so uh, they they are an excellent last mile solution. And when I meet, talk about last mile, uh, as people have pointed out here. There's a tremendous amount of fiber optic cable just running around the region. Uh, it belongs to electric cooperatives. It belongs to counties. It belongs to the state. Some of it belongs to providers. It belongs to telephone companies. There's a lot of fiber. Uh, and uh, so getting the backbone, getting that primary bandwidth <coughs> to the region is generally not the problem. The problem is what we call the last mile. It's getting that internet service from wherever that high speed connection is, that fiber optic cable, to your house or to your business. And uh, radios are a great tool for making that last mile push because a pair of radios, extremely inexpensive radios, really, uh, can, can bring speeds uh, easily of 20, 25, 50, 100, and even 300 or more megabits per second to a home or a business uh, within 
a radius of as much as 15 or more miles. So, uh, you know, it's a tremendous tool. Uh, it has its limitations, like everything does. Uh, most of the frequencies we use are uh, bound by a line of sight. So you have to be able to see the broadcast uh, of, of that radio transmitter from your house or your business in order to get great service. However, a lot of that can also be uh, overcome by having relays where uh, a radio reaches a high point in the community and from there additional broadcasts can reach out to other, other homes and businesses in the community. So, uh, so building out this kind of network with a, with a fiber optic backbone and uh, high speed radio connections, uh, we feel is going to be a very important part of, of the emerging broadband initiative uh, everywhere in the world, except in the southern United States. Um, also, I think it's, it's, it's useful to mention uh, for, for the geeks in the crowd that uh, there, there is also a lot of new developments in fiber optic technology that uh, allows uh, a single fiber or a few fibers to be uh, parsed out, if you will, to be uh, exploited to serve a variety, to go in, a, in different directions and to provide service to a number of different networks. Uh, and that technology now has dropped in price dramatically so that, uh, you know, the potential of those 183 fibers that are laying in the ground has exponentially increased in, in recent years. Uh, so there, there's a lot of opportunity, there's a lot of uh, potential, and um, we're very excited about being a part of it. Uh, just a couple things that we've done recently, um, starting in the middle of last year, uh, we built out a 500, approximately 500 home community in the mountains north of, of Asheville, up in Yancey County, um, essentially from scratch. So uh, uh, you know, this was a community that did not have significant broadband service. We built it out, we provided a, a trunk connection to the community, and we, uh, we pr are providing uh, 60 megabits per second up and down to every home in the community. And we did that in seven months. Um, so that's that. You know, that's the there's a potential for very quick development to happen with this combination of fiber and radio technology. Uh, we're also partnering right now with a rural electric cooperative in the eastern part of the state. We're really excited about this work. Um, like many many electric cooperatives, they have uh, a lot of fiber optic cable running around their counties that they serve. Uh, which they put in place in order to mo monitor their own, you know, their electric substations and their equipment. Well, they looked around and realized that, hey, we've got this resource, what can we do? And again, uh, using new <coughs> fiber technologies, new radio technologies, uh, we are working on a project with them right now to exploit that fiber optic cable and provide service basically to their entire population of, of electrical customers. Uh, and that, that again, will be what is you know, now classified as broadband service, be better than 25 megabits per second uh, throughout their region. And these are communities where they have very, very high percentages of uh, people with, without any internet service. So we're super excited about that. Uh, cross that. Uh, have you back next year. I'll tell you how that's all. All right. Um, thank you. And maybe I just wanted to echo uh, what Art was saying about the hybrid fiber wireless system as being the future. Um, uh, as far as our ability to to deliver megabits per second to the end users from these wireless radios, before we can do that, we have to have access to you know to a fiber optic resource in order. It's like the fire hydrant you know, on the corner of the street, and then we can use that to, to spray it out here the radios to spray out the homes. Um, with that being said, uh, this type of network lends itself very easily to deploy fiber to the homes uh, if and when it is required. So if, it, if it's cost prohibitive or you don't have the line of stop path that you need, uh, with this type of deployment we're doing in the Far East, you simply drop the fiber line to the home off of a utility pole that already has the fiber resource and the wireless access points on it. So it, it simplifies everyone's one's job and a lot of what's needed to move these types of projects forward from, from my perspective and the perspective of being a wireless provider is the cooperation of pole attachments. That, that's a big one. Like if, if folks like us can 
uh, readily get access to, to the utility poles that exist in your region um, and leverage the fiber that's already there uh, using these new technologies. Uh, that, that greatly uh, alleviates a lot of the problems because now we might use someone's front deck as a relay point where the utility pole outside has electricity on it and we, we can pay the power company to build a relationship with them. Or in the case like what we're doing in the Far East, we're working with them you know, very, very closely and they drop the power, we put the equipment on and service the home. So I'd say that that's a big hurdle is identifying who the fiber belongs to and then any you know economic or business decisions as to why we cannot access it for economical rates. Um, that's probably one of the biggest hurdles for folks like Travis and, and us uh, to overcome to move into these communities. You know, who owns the fiber and, and why is it dark? Why can we not access it? You know, let's leverage some of these newest technologies and turn this stuff on. And with that being said, I, I think unanimously everyone agrees that wireless off the edge of fiber is, it sounds like it's the future of this. It's the solution. It's very cost effective to deploy to everyone's home and businesses uh, uh, without breaking the bank. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Lewis, you are actually the internet service provider for one of our, we have six libraries in the region, three in Madison County, two in Jackson, and one in Swain. Uh, you're actually the service provider for the Jackson County Public Library. Yes. And I know that you've gotten into wireless P2P internet over the last, in the last five years? Three years. Three years. If you want to talk all about your experience. I'm, uh, it all started, uh, I feel your pain. Uh, <laughs> How I got in business uh, was uh, using a wireless hotspot. No provider would service me where my house was located. And I had a daughter in school, and uh, I got my internet bill for that. Got my download program during school over the wireless Verizon hotspot, $649. Got a phone call from Verizon the next month and asked me if somebody had stolen my hotspot. Because that deal had already reached 400 and something dollars. So there had to be a better solution. Got to thinking about it. And lo and behold, I had a relative that was in this wireless business. And uh, Art and JJ helped my relative to get started. So they <coughs> was instrumental in that. So I owe my start to, to Skyliner out of Asheville. But what we do, I'm uh, an infant company. I'm concentrating in Jackson County and Swain County. We just started in a business in Swain County. I'm working with Tim on some projects uh, in the, between Cashers and, uh, and Silva, trying to get a community up there, some internet. But it, it's, the cost of the fiber backbone is, uh, it's expensive in our area. It seems like from when you get past Hickory this way or from Atlanta this way, the fiber costs are expensive. So, you pay, I pay $19 a meg down there. So, so $19 a meg. So what I'm banking on is when I'm selling that megs out there, if I provide you four or five megs, I'm banking on selling that one meg several times to cover that cost. So it's sort of like a shared system. You know, hopefully you're not using that same meg. So we gotta get the fiber costs down. Uh, it was expensive for the fiber companies to put their backbone in here in our region because of rock and we're so far away from infrastructure. But with that said, technologies has come a long ways. Not too many years ago, uh, fiber for our area was what, uh, Matt, 50 some dollars a meg. And it was almost impossible <coughs> to do the service that I'm doing now. It's still expensive. The backbone is, is uh, a lot of the expense of my company. And uh, we, we want to get those costs down. And uh, as Art said, wireless is a tremendous asset for uh, the, the terrain that we go through, doing the point to point. But we are limited. Uh, terrain can be our advantages, having a tower up on high on the mountain, reaching somebody. But five miles out, there's another mountain blocking the signal from going on on foot. I mean, some of our equipment will shoot a signal 30, 40, 50 miles. But there's always a mountain standing in the way and you're going to find those connections are going to be 8 to 12 miles, you know, here just from location. But uh, we've got the capability of providing some of the 
the 20 megs thing. Uh, equipment's getting, even in the last couple years, it's improved tremendously. And the cost has actually come down a little bit, making it more affordable to get it on. Thank you. Uh, Matt, you are our internet service provider here. I can say we, we're like a force multiplier. There are people come into this library and our other libraries, they come in every week, some of them every day, to check their email, to do some stuff, because what are our download speeds here, John? About 29, 26? Actually here, 30. 30. And I believe that's speed point point from Westnet? Well, that, yeah, the, the Westnet, correct. Which is so you want to talk to you? Yeah, and um, my name is Matt. Matt Sanger from Balsam West. I listen to Balsam West or Westnet. Well, uh, Balsam West acquired VNet at the first of the year and we rebranded it Westnet. So we're still going through that integration process. But, uh, I started with Balsam West seven years ago and, and primarily our focus was uh, commercial. And, and really Balsam West was created out of survival. Uh, our two partners, Drake Enterprises, and the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians needed a, a network that would support their mission critical applications. And that, and that was really how Boston West came to be and worked. Obviously, connected with them, uh, multiple hospitals throughout uh, the seven counties that Sarah represents. Uh, we continue to expand the network. Uh, currently, the network, uh, which is a, a ring self-healing network and all that really means is in the event that the network is cut, uh, traffic is rerouted and uh, hence that supports mission critical application. Uh, we're also connected to 48 uh, public schools, the library system, but uh, I realize for those who, who aren't getting internet service that that really doesn't mean much to them and I, and I agree with with these guys. I, I do think that uh, Part of the solution is a hybrid solution. Um, the, the, what I call the middle mile is in place. It's just getting uh, service from that middle mile out to people that need it. Uh, and obviously there are some challenges. Uh, I think technology is changing quickly. Uh, I'm even seeing the technology or they're talking about technology where you don't necessarily need to clear line of sight. Um, and when that comes out, I don't necessarily know, but uh, that, that may be the solution. Who knows? But I do know technology is, is changing rapidly and uh, for, for the better. But it, to build fiber is very expensive and it's probably cost prohibitive in a sparsely popul populated area, one from a, a business uh, standpoint on our side. And, and I don't think most uh, homeowners would want to pay the the cost of Bill Five, but we we are currently involved in some some projects in the region for a fiber to the home projects that uh, you know when you get a neighborhood that has four or five hundred homes, you can start to build a, a business case uh, for those types of uh, applications. Thank you, uh, Anthony and Bill from Morris Broadband. Uh, I know that you've been able to deliver some pretty high speeds. Uh, can you talk a little bit about sure. your experience? Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> Morris Broadband has been in operation about eight years. Uh, we took over uh, from Mediacom, the purchase assistant from Mediacom. And one of the first things we noticed in able to provide broadband services to this area, making in Jackson County, was being able to transport that internet traffic. Um, we wouldn't be able to offer more robust internet service to our customers without that. Uh, the internet services um, Gold City was our main head in, and so when we came to the city, it was fed out that it in uh, Gold City, top of the mountain, right where that ski lift used to be, that big lift used to be, it sits right up there. So we built, the first thing we did was we built an internet, a uh, fiber interconnect, through, from Henderson County, through Brevard, up through Cashiers, Highlands, in that area, to connect into Gold City. We also worked with partners to connect another redundant loop through Asheville, through Lanesville, up to Gold City. So then we had a fully redundant loop uh, present for transport for the internet traffic. In Harrison County, where everything connected, we were able to find providers to provide multiple redundant internet services. 
So basically, we had routes to Charlotte, route to Atlanta, so if something got cut in Charlotte, we could route to Atlanta. Same with our ring, like self-healing ring, like Matt was saying, one side got cut, we had the other way to route. That opened up the door to allow us to launch a technology called DOCSIS 3.0. And what DOCSIS 3.0 let us do is take the collapse of plant, uh, put some hardware in that gold city, and use our capacity in a better way for internet traffic. Um, it used to be that we would have multiple areas coming into a transmitter to the internet, say two or three subdivisions, and then we'd have one path to the internet. You all share that one path. With DOCSIS 3.0, we were allowed to take that and expand it. So we put in four channels, four channels. So this that we did a 300% increase to the areas in bandwidth capacity for transport to the internet. In the meantime, while we was doing that, Bill's team um, was working on enhancing the cable lines throughout the county. A lot of old cable, a lot of cracked cable, chewed cable, that type of thing. Uh, that interfered with a lot of the service teams. So Bill's team was working on that. Our, our uh, internet infrastructure team was working on that to make even further improvements. Uh, we would go into an area, you know, subdivision had 100 people, and they had those four channels they were on. We realized those four channels were full. Then we would build another fiber node in and put another transmitter so then there's eight channels in that area so that we can keep up with the demand bandwidth. That has been our biggest challenge as far as broadband and our broadband our service area is keeping up with demand bandwidth. As soon as we split an area and divide it out, it gets full again. Uh, and then we do it again. In Macon County, we just in April. We took an area and we divided it and we cut it and built fiber and added two more nodes and added, you know, uh, two more transmitters, which means we went from four channels to 16 channels in that area to load balance on. Um, and that still wasn't enough. So we began looking at our infrastructure and we're an analog infrastructure. Um, we have 62 analog cable channels. In your cable system, channels are capacity. And so, we, with one analog channel, you can do 12 channels digitally, you can do three channels HD, or you can do a path to the internet, a, a channel to the internet. So we determined that we need to go all digital, and all digital cable TV delivery. So we could use, we could deliver those 62 channels with only seven channels, because they were digital, and we could take that 50 channels and start using it in the That's where we are right now. That's our process right now. We're moving to an all-digital platform so that we can take those channels and we can uh, use them to for transport for our internet uh, product. Um, years ago, when we when we did the four channels per area, um, we launched 25 down. Now we do that now. We did the 50 meg and the 100 meg service. When we get done, we're instantly going to change every area that has four channels to 16 channels. So a 300% backbone increase. We've also invested in DOCSIS 3.1 technology, which allows you to even do more channels to that. So anybody, once we get done with the all digital launch, everybody will, will go from, from one channel to four channels to 16 channels to look out on. Um, with DOCSIS 3.1, it would be 32 channels. So you've got 100 people that were sharing one channel, now they're sharing 32 channels. So that opens the door for higher speeds via the coax plant. It offers where we can increase our standard speeds. Our goal is to 25 meg down, 3 meg to be the standard speed, not the 10 meg that we do now. Um, with this service will also allow us to give up, offer 300 to 400 meg services on the coax plant because we have that open capacity that we have on the system. Um, the technology is there to take the coax plant and use it even as high as 1 gig. Um, so that's what we're focused on. We have a collection of infrastructure in place. And we can take that and make it completely robust for our current customer base and make it available and robust so that we can begin to connect new customers to it. We also have a robust uh, fiber infrastructure here. Uh, we, do, uh, we just launched a new version of our, our fiber product where the registered engineer can take one fiber and do multiple gig connections. We've got multiple gig customers now, business customers, uh, with that. And it's the same service that can be used for fiber as well. Uh, we're also looking at a Greenfield 
possibility of, of putting fiber into an apartment complex in Callaway so that we'd have fiber uh, to every apartment complex. Uh, but we're, we're really focusing on the coaxial infrastructure so that because that's what we have in place uh, and making that robust so we can offer the higher speeds and the higher standard speeds. I think the one thing that we've all seen is that the demand for broadband is certainly existent and it, it's not a static thing. The demand today, which is I think fairly widespread, is not going to be the demand tomorrow. It's growing. People really want, once, well, as Tim said, once the once you've seen it and been able to see what you can do, it, you're not very happy with you know anything less. Um, if I have just the last few minutes open to uh, any questions for anybody, we got a lot of uh, expertise represented by these folks, so um, feel free. I um, also want to tell you that again, uh, we are live streaming this on Facebook. Uh, that will be linked. Um, from our library Sorry. Facebook site. Uh, Bobby Coggins with Making Media is making a video. And uh, so there'll hopefully be some record for people you know that wanted to come and couldn't come. And we're going to provide some links to anybody who signed up on our sheet uh, for some of the information. That sheet that might have got stalled down there. But if you haven't had a chance to sign it yet, um, you can always come up and do it afterwards, and I'll hand it up. You know. And yeah, let the question start. Um, I'm Ross Ramsey. I live in uh, Hickory Knoll across from Auto. Uh, we moved in about four years ago. My son works from home. We pay exorbitant prices to the cell phone people to be able to have internet. Um, we were told when we moved in there would be a cell in the house, and there was. But when we transitioned to Bachman House, the DSL provider said, it's bad, we don't want to provide, we don't want to support you anymore. We got rid of it. Um, and so we, we've had to work our way around. Um, when I spoke to um, an internet provider that does radio solutions in town, they said that there was a plan that they would put something, some sort of a radio tower out in the auto area. And I was excited because I know that works. Um, but about a year later when I called back, they said, well, there was some resistance to putting towers or some infrastructure. We didn't want to be hanging stuff all over the place because we like the way it looks here. Um, so I got the impression it was a the government was somewhere involved in saying, no, we're not going to do that. You know, uh, there was even some, uh, this is hearsay, and I apologize for not having enough facts, but it goes back as far as the Atlanta Olympics. They wanted to put up towers and infrastructure, and the people said, no, we, we don't want to uh, put that up in our landscape or anything else. So my question, I, I don't know if they're not even going to address it or not, is do we have a government support here? And are we going to be able to, to hang stuff off of towers? I, I'll, I'll jump in first, and then maybe you can speak to it more locally. Um, yeah, absolutely. I have local government support. I think that the debate over towers and the mountains goes back to when cell phones first came out, and um, change is difficult, but we we make that change, and then we um, wonder what we did without it. Um, so I think that um, although there are discussions, and I was on the Jackson County Planning Board when we revised um, the tower ordinance, and there was a lot of discussion about aesthetics, but not a single person on that board or on the county board that we were working for um, did not want them. Um, it's just a, a process that the counties want to make sure they go through properly. So I, I can't speak for specific local government officials, but I know my board, which is regional in nature, has fully supported us addressing this as a great regional issue, um, and we're not going to let the way some towers look stop us from getting service in the region. Uh, and I can speak from locally, we're definitely supportive. I'd like to ask the gentleman though, I, I didn't know you could camouflage a tower so easy. Uh, can you share some of the camouflage? Uh, yeah. So, one of the things I like to say about wireless ISPs, and if anybody's worked on an wireless ISP or been around at all, we're scrappy. And what I mean by that is we put antennas on the decks, we conceal them behind the sides. 
if there's a place for an antenna that will service someone and it's a useful place, uh, we execute an installation there. Uh, and we call those relays, and we can, you know, we have to be careful with these because it's sometimes our residential homes, and what if it burns down? What about the people? You know, we've had these things happen to us, so we're very keenly aware of what the ramifications are. But as far as camouflaging. Uh, towers. It, it, it's a very simple process, and on top of that, the tower is like, you know, Skyrider would deploy or Skyfire or any of the other wireless. If it more starts doing some wireless, uh, uh, these, these are spindly towers across the tree line. The way that we deploy them, uh, they're hard to be seen. Like unless you just get out your, not even binoculars, get out your telescope when you're looking for the equipment, you can't see it. It's just floating right above the trees, and. Uh, um, we've, we've worked in, in different counties, in Buncombe County, you know, they have these district health ordinances, so uh, we, we've learned the do's and don'ts, and so as far as getting the equipment in place, you know, a, a big part of it is, is organizing the community, like the, the folks that you um, uh, live around, you know, if, if you can pool those folks together, and get them to contact folks like Skyfire, Skyrunner, or Morris Broadband, or, or any of the providers represented here today. Um, that's a big part of it. We have to know that there's interest. Like, not just, oh yeah, I want it, but real interest. Like, bring us into your community, you know, feed us barbecue, and let us know <laughs> that, that there's some uh, interest there. And, and then we collect names, and then once we get that, we start coming up with a plan. The, the one that Art was talking about, that 500 home community, uh, there were some really overactive folks in that community that made it happen. They, they drug us in there and... Uh, it's great barbecue. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it really let us know that there was interest. And I think that any provider here will let you know that that's a big part of it. We have to you know, pull us in there and show us, you know, show us where it's needed. And, and we'll work with you guys and make it happen. What's the biggest obstacle for getting broadband and making Right. For, for us, I'd say the mountains and trying to penetrate and trying to maneuver around so you can get access. Am I right? Yeah. Um, and so return on investment. Yeah. I mean, if our seven western counties have 200,000 people in them, um, a big provider can reach that many people in a, you know, a couple blocks in a big city. You know what I mean? So we, we have to keep that in mind that just making the business case. Um, for a, a road that has um, four homes and a mile on it. I think, and I can't remember if there was a discussion with Morris Broadband and Jackson County, mm -hmm. and something sticks in my head that to make the case for new infrastructure into a particular community or something, and please correct me if I'm wrong, sure. but it was, uh, it was somewhere around like 16 homes per linear mile. And it's actually more than that. Okay. Yeah, it needs to be more than that. And it depends on if it's area or underground. Sure. Um, and we're willing to, anytime we look at a plan, we're willing to invest so much into it to make our own work. And we, we look at, and I'll share that with you, we look to at least start breaking even after five years, at the beginning of five years. That's what we look for. And if it doesn't make sense, we can invest any more into it. Um, so the idea of, and we can't reach out to give that money, but um, the idea that you mentioned about an outside provider can bring that in, um, partnering with us, we can invest so much in it, and then we get another investment, and we can make it work. Sure. And, I, and I'm simply using it just so you think about it. Since three homes, you know, and I'm yeah. sure this is the case in Macon yeah. County, I can certainly figure yeah. it in Jackson County. We've got a lot of areas where you ought to find 16 homes or more in a one mile, one million mile. Right. One, of, one of the other areas we run into once in a while, and I'm addressing the audience because we can use your help with this. Um, I'm not going to mention any names or anything. We had a condo association that was wanting broadband. Very easy for us to go into. We had to go through a subdivision. We were going to provide service to the subdivision. We had one homeowner refuse to let us cross their property. <laughs> Any, any homeowners associations that can obtain right of ways for us, help us out quite a bit. Um, we, we dealt with this for over two years. This, this condo association went without service for two years. Half of the condos have almost died. They, they can't sell. 
Um, we finally obtained the right of ways we needed. Um, we had both homeowners associations helping us. But once in a while, those things like that hold us up. There's people out there that just don't want technology for some reason. Um, and it's, it's a very simple solution. And if we'd have had right away, we'd have been in there two years ago. Do we have the internet service to Franklin? And is it distributing it from like downtown Franklin? Or is the problem getting the service to Franklin? Actually, the, the main track, and there, there's plenty of access. Where, where you run into is probably parts of the middle mile and the last mile. Uh, yeah, last like half mile. mile. Yeah, the last half mile. I, mean, I like to say the last quarter mile. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, probably over here it's the last quarter mile. <laughs> yeah, it's the last half mile. We have really good middle mile fiber in this region. For a rural region, we're very fortunate. And the fact that our schools all have fiber to and health care, and um, the fiber we have in the ground is significant for how rural we are, um, but it was not built to go to the home. And, and that's this last mile, quarter mile discussion. Yeah, I would like to expand on what she's saying on the, on the last mile, quarter mile, and, and the, it was mentioned earlier that the Golden Leaf uh, Foundation, that, so it, I encourage you to go online and look it up. It's MCNC or Golden Leaf. There, there's a fiber loop that runs around the entire you know, circumference of the state. It was put in, I believe, correct me because if I'm wrong, but uh, with tobacco money, you know, after the lawsuit. So, uh, and so that's why we're sitting on such a resource. And many folks, uh, probably Morris and the ERC, Boston West, they, they tap into that. Uh, and there's these lease programs where you can tap into this. And that's a big part of the reason that we're in good shape in regards to middle and, and, and well, middle mile fiber, it is called. Um, but what's really useful is you know organizing the community and taking. I think you mentioned the, the art grants earlier. We have worked with the ARC um, in, a, in another county, and those are definitely um, vehicles that can get service to your home, and, and they have to have. You know, recipient. In the case of you know the other county we're working with, it was the county that received it and then transmits it to us when we need certain milestones. And um, I believe there's ARC money available in. in maybe. Well, I think you know, this might be a rich question. But, um, it seems like I read something from the broadband infrastructure office about some grants that are being made available, and Jackson County might be up for a couple. We have uh, made application through an interview. Uh, my office has done quite a bit of work for funding that would go to assist Last back up okay. for um, uh, equipment purchases. We originally went after funding for additional towers. Uh, to the back to the discussion about the towers, not only locally but at the federal level, that can get a little dicey with environmental concerns. So we restructured that and modeled it after a. Uh, a grant that I believe was successful down there. <coughs> that, was, uh, that was, I think, they, yeah, that was you guys. And uh, so uh, um, we uh, a, we found a nonprofit organization that could be the fiscal agent uh, for uh, this application. And uh, we, we feel strongly, we have not got that award, but we, we feel strongly that we've made a pretty significant business case that um, we can increase uh, high speed connectivity exponentially. And also with the current setup that SkyFi is utilizing, we can demonstrate that there are a couple of existing tower locations um, or, or towers that will be constructed that could also provide service into our neighboring counties of Maiden and Swain if that you know was something that, that you know, wanted to happen. And, and typically those funding agencies like it when it's when it's uh, going to benefit as many people as is absolutely possible. So I, I don't have final award of that, but we're, we're certainly very hopeful that within a couple months we'll, we'll have some help on that basis that will help the sky fight out tremendously. Yeah, Charles, we've heard a tremendous amount of information from a lot of very smart people. I'm sure some competing interests as well. How do we take everything that has been said here and move it to the next step to actually 
move forward to providing service to the people who want it. What, what's the what's the end what's the end to that? What's the magic bullet? I think from our standpoint, I think that's been what I stood up here. You were Sarah. There's a there's a phase that you gotta go through. We're, I feel like we were in for phase one. How many that you feel like at least, but okay. phase one should happen fairly quickly. Right. Mm -hmm. We are ready for that. Um, and, and we, I, I need to make the connection with her to get that moving in her. Essentially, you know, the way I see it is there's a lot of unknowns right now. Um, and there's a lot of moving parts and laws are changing. Um, funding streams are becoming available that didn't used to exist. Um, in order to be ready for opportunities, we have to be planned, and that's what we're doing as a region. Also, one thing I think yep. it's, it's important that we, as a county, have some cohesiveness to uh, access. Because uh, we, we don't want that. The goal is to not have the haves and the have-nots. The goal is to connect as many people as possible. And that even covers in the first show. Now, the timeline is phase one will be September through December of this year. And phase two will pick right up um, early spring of next year. Um, that will be the creation of Region A's broadband plan implementation of broadband is going to be community by community specific but if a big you know federal grant opportunity comes available that some of these providers can partner with local government on public private partnership will then be able to say to that funding agency we're ready we've gone through the steps here's what we have so we're, we're just trying to lay some groundwork in, in the anticipation of The grant resources aren't just governmental, no. I mean, you got Google, mm -hmm. you got Amazon, you got Citrus, I mean, um, anyway, there's a number of private entities out there that are pouring vast amounts of money into the world because they want the markets, not their providers. Which is why we're going to work with um, consultants who are experts in the field so that I get out of my, I mean, I'm a, I'm a government person. I, I work for local, state, and federal government. The consultants and experts and private providers themselves are much more in touch with the entire world and movement of where broadband is going, and that's who we're going to tap into to work in this region. And I, I would add to that, I don't think the community efforts, the municipality, the municipal efforts, the county efforts, I don't think they're mutually exclusive from a regional way. And so, for example, in Jackson County, you know, my goal is to continue working on sort of multiple fronts that we're currently undertaking, but also to do the behind the scenes work to get us ready to bring the, the relevant information for Jackson County to the regional table so that when the time comes, for, for larger funding, we're, we're there in a relevant part of the discussion. And I think that's well, the key point to the, to the regional process is let's all make sure that, that you know, we, we get this work done and the groundwork done so that when, when and if the time comes, that we can move regionally to get funding and get assistance from whomever it may be, that we're, we're certainly positioned well to do so. So Sarah, you mentioned uh, phase one. Uh -huh. September through December phase two. How, in terms of this portion of years, how far away are we from getting an actual product? Well, this process from start to finish will be a year. Um, but like Rich said, I'm not, I can't over promise. This process is to not for the region to go in and implement broadband in every little community, it's for the region to work with experts to educate each community's broadband committee on their specific community opportunities and get them ready to go out and talk to providers and have something to offer. I think the consultant factor is what I feel like our need is uh -huh. making county. We need somebody that we need can help you out. I saw you on there with me. I'm sure. 
I guess uh, I just want to share my opinion that, um, you know, however you get it done, getting it done would be fantastic. The shorter the timeline, the better. I mean, you guys are describing something I'm like, why are you not here right now? You want some barbecue? <laughs> um, you know, uh, Boris Broadband. Will make it happen. <laughs> All right. Well, Boris Broadband, I called you. It sounds like you service like 20% of the area, so it's great that you're expanding the bandwidth to those people. I don't know if I'm ever going to see you. DNet, same thing. I called you, can I get the fixed point wireless? You're like, oh, we tried to put up a tower in auto, but it didn't happen for whatever reason. And I'm like, well, when is it going to happen? Is it ever going to happen? The guy I talked to seemed like it was not optimistic. No one called me back. No one sent us anyone out to the site. So as far as I can see, the existing businesses are not serving the area. So either, you know, you do that, or the government steps in and gives you the stick or the carrot to do so. Well, I think one thing that's happening with increased demand is what I call disruption. And there's several disruptors here on this front. <laughs> 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 uh, who, you know, the, the, the wireless uh, Tim, you're the original disruptor. You saw a need for something <laughs> right then. And I think that. These guys who are going out and making something happen say, we're not going to wait, we're going to make something happen. We're going to pull the rest, everybody else, into the game. Otherwise, you know, you get left behind. So, mm -hmm. you know, this is a good thing with, with this road. What, what do you mean to do you live in? Auto. Auto. I got one and a half megabit DSL. I work remotely. It's a nightmare. You're I may blessed. have to move. <laughs> You're right. blessed. Yeah. <laughs> we need to wrap this up. Just have for a couple more questions. People have had their hand up for a while, and then I'll start with Tim. If you can. What is this? Really comment? quick comment. We've had a community call up for Cartouche where we went and we signed up. I believe it's now 50 people willing to pay $45 a month for broadband. We have a site where most of the houses can see on. Uh, on a knob, and uh, for lack of, I'd say $10,000 for an antenna, we haven't been able to move forward. Now we're moving forward, we'll do bake sales, but it's working within the community. I will just tell you, right, and if I, it's going to happen, it's going to happen at the community level. We have a representative from our community club here. You know, get in touch. They they got they got things moving. They they made contacts. They know what they want. And so I would say start at the local level, right where you're at, where you don't have broadband and you want it. Find well, some of these people that are also going. Yeah, we really need it, and we'll lay the broad the, hopefully the groundwork and region A and, and the counties can can do the work that needs to be done so that the service providers can. Can provide service. A couple more questions and we'll call it first. You two, I think, had your hands up the longest. Sorry. What do you think my chances are of getting the same deal that the food line people got? You don't know anything about that? They got the best service in the United States, and they're in North Carolina. They built their own. Uh, there's some legal barriers to communities building their own, uh, too. Questions here? Um, I got a late last month, Frontier put out a uh, press release about the Connect America Fund and how they're getting money for that. Yeah. And they post, they had four communities listed there that were going to, they're going to start their investments in to bring them up to a minimum of 10 megabit for all customers and faster as they can do it. And that was Franklin, Cashers, Cherokee, and Haysville. And I'm wondering for the county people here, um, is there any talks with Frontier about that to make sure that they're being held accountable for that and, and, and pursuing that and, and any hurdles they may have? Because I believe they have to lay all the copper uh, in the communities but, and then all the fiber up to their, their uh, boxes. For the hurdle. Okay. I'm, That's what I've been finding. I, I am a, I'm aware that there have been location uh, in Jackson County and also uh, on the Paul Valley that have received some improved service with regard to Connect America funds. I would term those improvements as welcome. 
but limited. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm not aware that there will be additional funding anytime in the foreseeable future to expand that service. Fundamentally, uh, I am one of those customers who is a Verizon DSL customer. Um, I live less than a mile from uh, one of those critical uh, services that Matt was speaking about. In fact, I used to be employed for that organization. <laughs> and I can also probably throw a baseball to hit where the fiber runs under the ground. But yet, from Frontier DSL, I am a uh, 1.3 down and 0.5 up customer uh, in a fairly large subdivision. So I feel you, thank you. All right, last question. Thanks for your patience. Uh, Jim Hunter, I live in the auto community. You can hear me from the Jack Brothers back there. Um, first of all, kudos, really, in my case, to Morris. We screamed and squeaked the wheel a lot at you, what? Media company. We had underground cable. You came in and you were <coughs> some of the underground with overhead. I've got questions actually for both of you. Clarification. Do I understand now that with the old, older, and newer old cable, if you get fiber close enough, you can send it up the old lines? Is that what you said? Before? Yeah, what we're doing is we can, with the infrastructure upgrade, we can take your existing coax to plant and offer the higher speeds, 25 to 50 to 100. And once we go all digital, then we'll be able to dedicate more bandwidth and we can do even two to three like that. Without Using, replacing anything. There may be some sections that need replaced. We'll go in and we'll check it. When we start going all digital, that digital signal has to be very fine tuned compared to analog. And that'll tell us. And a lot of times we'll identify additional cable lines that we'll have to replace and we'll replace them. What they said before with all the new nodes and everything, and that you know, be all aware of it. We're at the end of the line down there, and overutilization was a, was a big issue. I watched baseball games and hockey and stop action, and, you know. but you've got it now, so it's 10 to 12 reliable. I don't even salvage it also. Kudos, and I appreciate that. Okay. Um, Tom. Yes. Quidal Ed, hydrologic. Mm -hmm. Who services that? Well, they're tied to the balsam on one end, and they've got fiber going up the Coweta up the road on the front end, and they get some some type of service off of uh, the DSL link into into there, but not much. But mostly they, they have a, a private connection. So there's no way of tapping into any of what they have there. Well, there is, there isn't. I mean, if you if you go online and if you just Google fiber maps, Macon County, uh, you will see a, a litany of maps, images come up that will show you where all the fiber is. And you'll see the fiber running behind Coweta going to Atlanta. You'll see the 441 leg that comes down. What you won't see are the 50, 60, 70 miles of fiber that is buried in all of the roads coming off of 441 and you ought to you know, because that's dark fiber. And you know, I hear this conversation about you know it costs so much to put it in there. Well evidently somebody didn't think it cost too much to put it in there because they put it in there and never used it. So you know it sort of throws me on the wrong track. But nonetheless, uh, you can find where all this fiber is just simply going out there. The state site uh, NC one, one other finishing question to that. What are the drawbacks of talking about the Habersham in the Dillard? Is it state line issues to bring that over? No. It's an economic issue. Um, and we're trying to talk to them. Well, thank you all for coming. And thank my invitees for coming. Mm -hmm. <laughs>